Welcome everyone, today in Rich and Spiritual, Presents Prosperity, Volume 2 by Charles Fillmore. Chapter 1, God has provided prosperity for every home. The home is the heart of the nation. The heart is the love center. Love is the world's greatest attractive power. The electromagnet that lifts the ingots of steel must first be charged with the electric current, for without the current it is powerless. So the heart of man, or the home that is the heart of the nation, must be aglow with God's love, then it becomes a magnet drawing all good from every direction. God has amply provided for every home, but the provision is in universal substance, which responds only to law. Through the application of the law the substance is drawn to us and begins to work for us. It is the law of love that we have whatsoever we desire. As a father gives his children gifts so the Lord gives to us, because of love. When we desire a right, we put our thoughts into the supermind realm, we contact God mind and from it draw the invisible substance that is manifest in temporal things. The substance thus becomes a part of our mind and through it of our affairs. We draw spiritual substance to ourselves just as the magnet draws the iron. When we think about the love of God drawing to us the substance necessary for support and supply, that substance begins to accumulate all around us, and as we abide in the consciousness of it, it begins to manifest itself in all our affairs. Perfect love casteth out fear. Fear is a great breeder of poverty, for it breaks down positive thoughts. Negative thoughts bring negative conditions in their train. The first thing to do in making a demonstration of prosperity in the home is to discard all negative thoughts and words. Build up a positive thought atmosphere in the home, an atmosphere that is free from fear and filled with love. Do not allow any words of poverty or lack to limit the attractive power of love in the home. Select carefully only those words that charge the home atmosphere with the idea of plenty, for like attracts like in the unseen as well as the seen. Never make an assertion in the home, no matter how true it may look on the surface, that you would not want to see persist in the home. By talking poverty and lack you are making a comfortable place for these unwelcome guests by your fireside, and they will want to stay. Rather fill the home with thoughts and words of plenty, of love, and of God's substance, then the unwelcome guests will soon leave you. Do not say that money is scarce, the very statement will scare money away from you. Do not say that times are hard with you. The very words will tighten your purse strings until omnipotence itself cannot slip a dime into it. Begin now to talk plenty, think plenty, and give thanks for plenty. Enlist all the members of the home in the same work. Make it a game. It's lots of fun, and, better than that, it actually works. Every home can be prosperous, and there should be no poverty-stricken homes, for they are caused only by inharmony, fear, negative thinking and speaking. Every visible item of wealth can be traced to an invisible source. Food comes from grain, which was planted in the earth, but who sees or knows the quickening love that touches the seed and makes it bear a hundredfold? An unseen force from an invisible source acts on the tiny seeds, and supply for the multitude springs forth. The physical substance that we name earth is the visible form of a superabundant mind substance, everywhere present, pervading all things, and inspiring all things to action. When the grain or seed is put into the earth, the quickening thought of the universe causes the little life germ to lay hold of the spiritual substance all about it and what we call matter proves to be a form of mind. There is no matter, all is mind. Words are also seeds, and when dropped into the invisible spiritual substance, they grow and bring forth after their kind. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Farmers and gardeners choose their seed with the greatest care. 
They reject every defective seed they find and in this way make sure of the coming crop. To have prosperity in your home you will have to exercise the same intelligent discrimination in the choice of your seed words. You should expect prosperity when you keep the prosperity law. Therefore, be thankful for every blessing that you gain and as deeply grateful for every demonstration as for an unexpected treasure dropped into your lap. This will keep your heart fresh, for true thanksgiving may be likened to rain falling upon ready soil, refreshing it and increasing its productiveness. When Jesus had only a small supply he gave thanks for the little he had. This increased that little into such an abundance that a multitude was satisfied with food and much was left over. Blessing has not lost its power since the time Jesus used it. Try it and you will prove its efficacy. The same power of multiplication is in it today. Praise and thanksgiving impart the quickening spiritual power that produces growth and increase in all things. You should never condemn anything in your home. If you want new articles of furniture or new clothes to take the place of those you now have, do not talk about your present things as old or shabby. Watch your words. See yourself clothed as befits a child of the king and see your house furnished just as pleases your ideal. Thus plant in the home atmosphere the seed of richness and abundance. It will all come to you. Use the patience, the wisdom, and the assiduity that the farmer employs in planting and cultivating, and your crop will be sure. Your words of truth are energized and vitalized by the living spirit. Your mind is now open and receptive to an influx of divine ideas that will inspire you with the understanding of the potency of your own thoughts and words. You are prospered. Your home is a magnet of love, drawing to it all good from the unfailing and inexhaustible reservoir of supply. Your increase comes because of your righteous application of God's law in your home. The blessing of Jehovah, it mocketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow therewith. Jesus showed men how to live in rest and peace, a simple life. Where the simplicity of his teaching is received and appreciated the people change their manner of living, doing away with ostentation and getting down to the simplicity and beauty of the things that are worthwhile. Every summer those who feel that they can, plan to go away for a vacation and many of them enjoy a small cabin in the woods where they can live a simple and natural life close to nature. This shows that they long to let go of the burdens of conventionality and rest in touch with the real of things. The soul wearies of the wear and tear of the artificial world, and now and then it must have a season of rest. Jesus invites, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is a great difference between the simple life and poverty. The two have been associated in the minds of some people, and this is the reason they shun the idea of the simple life. Even those who have come into some degree of spiritual understanding sometimes put out of mind all thought of a simple manner of living, because they fear that others will think they are failing to demonstrate prosperity. In such cases those who judge should remember to, judge not according to appearance, and those who are judged should be satisfied with the praise of God rather than with the praise of men. All those who base their prosperity on possessions alone have a purely material prosperity which, though it may seem great for a time, will vanish, because it is founded on the changing of the external and has no root within the consciousness. There is a great similarity in the homes of nearly all people who have about the same sized incomes. Each one unconsciously follows suggestion and furnishes his home with the same sort of things as his neighbors. Here and there are exceptions. Someone is expressing his or her individuality, overcoming mass suggestion and buying the kind of furniture he really wants or that is really comfortable and useful. This free, independent spirit has much in its favor in making a prosperity demonstration. The delusion that it is necessary to be just like other people or to have as much as other people have, 
causes a spirit of anxiety that hinders the exercise of faith in demonstration. The simple life does not imply poverty and it is not ascetic. It is as different from the austere as it is from wanton luxury. It is the natural, free, childlike, mode of living, and one never really knows what true prosperity is until one comes into this simplicity and independence of spirit. The simple life is a state of consciousness. It is peace, contentment, and satisfaction in the joy of living and loving, and it is attained through thinking about God and worshipping Him in spirit and in truth. You want to learn how to demonstrate prosperity in your home by the righteous exercise of powers and faculties that God has given you. Realize in the very beginning that you do have these powers and faculties. You are in possession of everything necessary for the demonstration of prosperity and can undertake it with the utmost confidence and faith. You can draw on the omnipresent substance throughout all eternity, yet it will never grow less, for it consists of ideas. Through thinking you take some of these ideas into your mind and they begin to become manifest in your affairs. Love is one of the ideas that provide a key to the infinite storehouse of abundance. It opens up generosity in us. It opens up generosity in others when we begin to love and bless them. Will it also open up a spirit of generosity in God? It certainly will and does. If you consciously love and bless God, you will soon find that things are coming your way. It will surprise you that just thinking about God will draw to you the things you want and expect, and bring many other blessings that you had not even thought about. Thousands of persons have proved this law to their entire satisfaction and we have many records that illustrate how people have demonstrated abundance in the very face of apparent lack, simply by thinking about the love of God and thanking Him for what they have. This law will demonstrate itself for you or for anyone who applies it faithfully, for, love never faileth. Men in business and industry have demonstrated great amounts of money through love. They did not love God, but the love of money attracted the money to them. It drew the substance right to them and enabled them to accumulate money, but merely as material, without the divine idea that assures permanence. We hear about men in high finance going bankrupt quite as often as we hear about men making great fortunes. When we develop a spiritual consciousness, we transfer this personal love to a higher and more stable plane, from the love of money in material things to the love of God and thus conceived it will attract to us all the resources of infinite mind forever and ever. Once make a connection with the universal bank of God and you have a permanent source of wealth. Jesus said that when we come to the altar to make an offering, we should have nothing in our heart against our brother. He said that before we can make contact with the love and power of God we must first make peace with our brother. This means that we must cultivate a love for our fellows in order to set the attractive force of love into operation. All we need do is quicken our love for others by thinking about love and casting out of our mind all hate and fear that would weaken the perfect working of that mighty magnet. As love attracts, hate dissipates. Before you approach God's altar of plenty, go and make friends with your brother men. Make friends even with the money powers. Do not envy the rich. Never condemn those who have money merely because they have it and you do not. Do not question how they got their money and wonder whether or not they are honest. All that is none of your business. Your business is to get what belongs to you, and you do that by thinking about the omnipresent substance of God and how you can lay hold of it through love. Get in touch with God riches in spirit, lay hold of them by love, and you will have sufficient for every day. Love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. The eternal law of spirit goes right on operating regardless of what you may think, say, or do. It is ordained that love will bring you prosperity, and you need not wonder whether it will or how it will. Be not therefore anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or, what shall we drink? 
or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Do not worry. Worry is a thief and a robber, for it keeps your good from you. It breaks the drawing law of love, the law that says. Perfect love casteth out fear. Banish worry by quietly and confidently affirming the drawing power of divine love as the constantly active magnet that attracts your unfailing supply. A good affirmation to rout worry is one like this, divine love bountifully supplies and increases substance to meet my every need. Nearly all books or articles that deal with success or prosperity stress the well-known virtues of honesty, industry, system and order, faithfulness, hard work. These make an excellent foundation and can be developed. Anyone with determination and will can overcome habits of laziness, carelessness, and weakness. The use of the will is very important in the demonstration of prosperity. If there is disorder or lack of system in your home, overcome it. Affirm, I will to be orderly. I will be orderly. I will be systematic in all my work and affairs. I am systematic. I am orderly. I am efficient. It takes the use of the will to be persistent, and we must be persistent in making demonstrations. Spasmodic efforts count for little, and many people give up too easily. If things don't come out just right the first time they try, they say the law is wrong and make no further effort. Anything so much worthwhile as prosperity in the home, and especially a permanent and unfailing supply that continues to meet the daily needs year after year, is worth any effort that we can make. Then be patient but be persistent. Declare, I am not discouraged. I am persistent. I go forward. When success fails to crown our very first efforts we become discouraged and quit. Then we try to console ourselves with the old thought that it is God's will for us to be poor. Poverty is not God's will, but man lays it to the charge of God to excuse his own feeling of inadequacy and defeat. God's will is health, happiness, and prosperity for every man, and to have all that is good and beautiful in the home is to express God's will for us. God's will is not expressed in a hovel, nor in any home where discord, lack, and unhappiness are entertained. Even a human guest would not stay long in such a home. To have a prosperous home prepared as the abiding place of God, who gives prosperity to all his children and adds no sorrow therewith. Determine to know God's will and do it. Affirm, I am determined to achieve success through doing God's will. That sums up the whole law. God is more willing to give than we are to receive. What we need to do is to determine what is His will, what He is trying to give, and open ourselves to receive His bounty. We do that by willing to do His will. You can be and have anything that you will to be and to have. Will to be healthy. Will to be happy. Will to be prosperous. There are many persons who will to be prosperous and who have made up their minds, as they think, very determinately. But they have not overcome all doubts, and when their demonstration is delayed, as it is in such cases, the doubt increases until they lose faith altogether. What they need is more persistence and determination. The word determined is a good word, a strong, substantial word with power in it. Jesus said that his words were spirit and life and would never pass away. Emerson says that words are alive and if you cut one it will bleed. Use the word determined and emphasize it in your affirmations. If things do not seem to come fast enough, determine that you will be patient. If negative thoughts creep in, determine to be positive. If you feel worried about the results, determine to be optimistic. In response to every thought of lack or need determined to be prosperous. The Lord has prosperity to give, and those who are determined go after their share. Jesus was quite positive and very determined in all his affirmations. 
He made big claims for God, and demonstrated them. Without the slightest doubt that the money would be there, he told Peter to put his hand into the fish's mouth and take out the wanted money. His prayers were made of one strong affirmation after another. The Lord's Prayer is a series of determined affirmations. We claim the will of God is for us to be rich, prosperous, and successful. Make up your mind that such is God's will for you and your home and you will make your demonstration. In the Old Testament, in the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, there is a fine prosperity lesson for any home. The widow represents one who has lost his consciousness of God's supply and support. That divine idea of God as all abundance is our true support. The two children of this home represent the thoughts of debt, what the family owes, and what someone owes the family. The prophet is divine understanding. The house is the body consciousness. The pot of oil is faith in spiritual substance. The neighbors are outside thoughts, and their, empty vessels, are thoughts of lack. To go in, and shut the door, as the widow was told to do, is to enter the inner consciousness and shut out the thoughts of lack. This is followed by strong words of affirmation, pouring, the substance into all the places that seem to be empty or to lack, until all are full. In conclusion it is affirmed that every obligation is met, every debt paid, and there is so much left over that there are no vessels left to hold it. This compares with the promise of God, I will. Open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Heaven, represents the mind. All this is done in the mind, and you can do it. Carry each step forward in your imagination exactly as if it were occurring in the without. Form your prosperity demonstration in your mind, then hold to the divine law of fulfillment. And, having done all. Stand. You may not be able to fill all the vessels with oil on your first attempt, but as you practice the method day by day your faith will increase and your results will be in proportion to your increasing faith. Work at the problem until you prove it. Apply the principle and the solution is sure. If it does not come at once, check over your methods carefully and see wherein your work has not been true. Do not allow one empty thought to exist in your mind but fill every nook and corner of it with the word plenty, plenty, plenty. If your purse seems empty, deny the lack and say. You are filled even now, with the bounty of God, my Father, who supplies all my wants. If your rooms are empty, deny the appearance and determine that prosperity is manifest in every part of every room. Never think of yourself as poor or needy. Do not talk about hard times or the necessity for strict economy. Even, the walls have ears, and, unfortunately, memories too. Do not think how little you have, but how much you have. Turn the telescope of your imagination around and look through the other end. Revile not the king, no, not in thy thought and revile not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the heavens shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the streams of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also doth not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge are the chambers filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Jehovah will open unto thee his good treasure. And the Almighty will be thy treasure, and precious silver unto thee. Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. Trust in Jehovah, and do good, dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. Jehovah will give grace and glory, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly.
that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and that I may fill their treasuries. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Chapter 2, God Will Pay Your Debts Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. In these words Jesus expressed an infallible law of mind, the law that one idea must be dissolved before another can take its place. If you have in your mind any thought that someone has wronged you, you cannot let in the cleansing power of spirit and the richness of spiritual substance until you have cast out the thought of the wrong, have forgiven it fully. You may be wondering why you have failed to get spiritual illumination or to find the consciousness of spiritual substance. Perhaps the reason is here, a lack of room for the true thoughts because other thoughts fill your mind. If you are not receiving the spiritual understanding you feel you should have, you should search your mind carefully for unforgiving thoughts. Thoughts are things, and occupy space in the mind realm. They have substance and form and may easily be taken as permanent by one not endowed with spiritual discernment. They bring forth fruit according to the seed planted in the mind, but they are not enduring unless founded in spirit. Thoughts are alive and are endowed by the thinker with a secondary thinking power, that is, the thought entity that the I am forms assumes an ego and begins to think on its own account. Thoughts also think but only with the power you give to them. Tell me what kind of thoughts you are holding about yourself and your neighbors, and I can tell you just what you may expect in the way of health, finances, and harmony in your home. Are you suspicious of your neighbors? You cannot love and trust in God if you hate and distrust men. The two ideas love and hate, or trust and mistrust, simply cannot both be present in your mind at one time, and when you are entertaining one, you may be sure the other is absent. Trust other people and use the power that you accumulate from that act to trust God. There is magic in it, it works wonders, love and trust are dynamic, vital powers. Are you accusing men of being thieves, and fear that they are going to take away from you something that is your own? With such a thought generating fear and even terror in your mind and filling your consciousness with darkness, where is there room for the Father's light of protection? Rather build walls of love and substance around yourself. Send out swift, invisible messengers of love and trust for your protection. They are better guards than policemen or detectives. Do not judge others as regards their guilt or innocence. Consider yourself and how you stand in the sight of the Father for having thoughts about another's guilt. Begin your reform with yourself. That means much to one who enjoys an understanding of mind and its laws, though it may mean little to the ordinary individual. He who knows himself superficially, just his external personality, thinks he has reformed when he has conformed to the moral and governmental laws. He may even be filled with his own self-righteousness and daily lift up his voice to praise God that he is not as other men are, that he has forgiven men their transgressions. He looks on all men who do not conform to his ideas of morality and religion as being sinners and transgressors and thanks God for his own insight and keenness. But he is not at peace. Something seems lacking. God does not talk to him, face to face, because the mind, where God and man meet, is darkened by the murky thought that other men are sinners. Our first work in any demonstration is to contact God, therefore we must forgive all men their transgressions. Through this forgiveness we cleanse our mind so that the Father can forgive us our own transgressions. Our forgiving, all men, includes ourselves. You must also forgive yourself. Let the finger of denial erase every sin or, falling short, that you have charged up against yourself. Pay your debt by saying to that part of yourself which you think has fallen short, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing befall thee. Then, loose him, and let him go. Treat sin as a mental transgression 
instead of considering it as a moral deflection. Deny in thought all tendency to the error way and hold yourself firmly to the Christ Spirit, which is your divine self. Part company forever with, accusing conscience. Those who have resolved to sin no more have nothing in common with guilt. Shall I be in debt as long as I hold debts against others? We find this to be the law of mind, a thought of debt will produce debt. So long as you believe in debt you will go into debt and accumulate the burdens that follow that thought. Whoever has not forgiven all men their debts is likely to fall into debt himself. Does this mean that you should give receipted bills to all those who owe you? No. That would not be erasing the thought of debt from your mind. First deny in mind that any man or woman owes you anything. If necessary, go over your list of names separately and sincerely forgive the thought of debt which you have been attaching to each person named. More bills may be collected in this way than in any other, for many of these people will pay what they owe when you send them this forgiving thought. Debt is a contradiction of the universal equilibrium, and there is no such thing as lack of equilibrium in all the universe. Therefore in spirit and in truth there is no debt. However, men hold on to a thought of debt, and this thought is responsible for a great deal of sorrow and hardship. The true disciple realizes his supply in the consciousness of omnipresent, universally possessed abundance. Spirit substance is impartial and owned in common, and no thought of debt can enter into it. Debts exist in the mind, and in the mind is the proper place to begin liquidating them. These thought entities must be abolished in mind before their outer manifestations will pass away and stay away. The world can never be free from the bondage of financial obligations until men erase from their minds the thoughts of, mine and thine, that generates debts and interest. Analyze the thought of debt and you will see that it involves a thought of lack. Debt is a thought of lack with absence at both ends, the creditor thinks he lacks what is owed him and the debtor thinks he lacks what is necessary to pay it, else he would discharge the obligation rather than continue it. There is error at both ends of the proposition and nothing in the middle. This being true, it should be easy to dissolve the whole thought that anyone owes us or that we owe anyone anything. We should fill our mind with thoughts of all sufficiency, and where there is no lack there can be no debts. Thus we find that the way to pay our debts is by filling our mind with the substance, of ideas that are the direct opposite, of the thoughts of lack that cause the debts. Ideas of abundance will more quickly and surely bring what is yours to you, than any thoughts you can hold about debtors discharging their obligations to you. See substance everywhere and affirm it, not only for yourself but for everyone else. Especially affirm abundance for those whom you have held in the thought of owing you. Thus you will help them pay their debts more easily than if you merely erased their names from your book of accounts receivable. Help pay the other fellow's debts by forgiving him his debts and declaring for him the abundance that is his already in spirit. The idea of abundance will also bring its fruits into your own life. Let the law of plenty work itself out in you and in your affairs. This is the way the Father forgives your debts not by cancelling them on his books but by erasing them from his mind. He remembers them no more against you when you deny their reality. The Father is the everywhere present spirit in which all that appears has its origin. God's love sees you always well, happy, and abundantly provided for, but God's wisdom demands that order and right relation exist in your mind before it may become manifest in your affairs as abundance. His love would give you your every desire, but his wisdom ordains that you forgive your debtors before your debts are forgiven. To remedy any state of limited finances or ill health that has been brought about by worry one must begin by eliminating the worry that is the original cause. One must free one's mind from the burden of debt before the debt can be paid. Many people have found that the statement, I owe no man anything but love, 
has helped them greatly to counteract this thought of debt. As they used the words their minds were open to an inflow of divine love and they faithfully co-operated with the divine law of forgiveness in thought, word, and deed. They built up such a strong consciousness of the healing and enriching power of God's love that they could live and work peacefully and profitably with their associates. Thus renewed constantly in health, in faith, and in integrity, they were able to meet every obligation that came to them. The statement, I owe no man anything but love, does not mean that we can disclaim owing our creditors money or try to evade the payment of obligations we have incurred. The thing denied is the burdensome thought of debt or of lack. The work of paying debts is an inner work having nothing to do with the debts already owed, but with the wrong thoughts that produce them. When one holds to the right ideas, burdensome debts will not be contracted. Debts are produced by thoughts of lack, impatient desire, and covetousness. When these thoughts are overcome, debts are overcome, forgiven, and paid in full, and we are free from them for all time. Your thoughts should at all times be worthy of your highest self, your fellow man, and God. The thoughts that most frequently work ill to you and your associates are thoughts of criticism and condemnation. Free your mind of them by holding the thought, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Fill your mind with thoughts of divine love, justice, peace, and forgiveness. This will pay your debts of love, which are the only debts you really owe. Then see how quickly and easily and naturally all your outer debts will be paid and all in harmonies of mind, body, and affairs smoothed out at the same time. Nothing will so quickly enrich your mind and free it from every thought of lack as the realization of divine love. Divine love will quickly and perfectly free you from the burden of debt and heal you of your physical infirmities, often caused by depression, worry, and financial fear. Love will bring your own to you, adjust all misunderstandings, and make your life and affairs healthy, happy, harmonious, and free, as they should be. Love indeed is the fulfillment of the law. The way is now open for you to pay your debts. Surrender them to God along with all your doubts and fears. Follow the light that is flooding into your mind. God's power, love, and wisdom are here, for His kingdom is within you. Give Him full dominion in your life and affairs. Give Him your business, your family affairs, your finances, and let Him pay your debts. He is even now doing it, for it is His righteous desire to free you from every burden, and He is leading you out of the burden of debt, whether of owing or being owed. Meet every insidious thought, such as, I can't, I don't know how, I can't see the way, with the declaration, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. You, shall not want, the wisdom, the courage to do, or the substance to do with when you have once fully realized the scope of the vast truth that Almightiness is leading you into, green pastures. Besides still waters. In the kingdom of truth and reality ideas are the coin of the realm. You can use the new ideas that divine wisdom is now quickening in your mind, and start this very moment to pay your debts. Begin by thanking God for your freedom from the debt burden thought. This is an important step in breaking the shackles of debt. The funds to pay all your bills may not suddenly appear in a lump sum, but as you watch and work and pray, holding yourself in the consciousness of God's leadership and His abundance, you will notice your funds beginning to grow, here a little, there a little, and increasing more and more rapidly as your faith increases and your anxious thoughts are stilled. For with the increase will come added good judgment and wisdom in the management of your affairs. Debt is soon vanquished when wisdom and good judgment are in control. Do not yield to the temptation of easy payment plans. Any payment that drains your pay envelope before you receive it is not an easy payment. Do not allow false pride to tempt you to put on a $1,000 front on a $100 salary. 
There may be times when you're tempted to miss paying a bill in order to indulge a desire for something. This easily leads one into the habit of putting off paying, which fastens the incubus of debt on people before they realize it. It is the innocent appearing forerunner of the debt habit and debt thought that may rob you of peace, contentment, freedom, integrity, and prosperity for years to come. The divine mind within you is much stronger than this desire mind of the body. Turn to it in a time like this, and affirm, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want, this thing until it comes to me in divine order. Bless your creditors with the thought of abundance as you begin to accumulate the wherewithal to pay off your obligations. Keep the faith they had in you by including them in your prayer for increase. Begin to free yourself at once by doing all that is possible with the means you have and as you proceed in this spirit the way will open for you to do more, for through the avenues of spirit more means will come to you and every obligation will be met. If you are a creditor, be careful of the kind of thoughts you hold over your debtor. Avoid the thought that he is unwilling to pay you or that he is unable to pay you. One thought holds him in dishonesty, and the other holds him subject to lack, and either of them tends to close the door to the possibility of his paying you soon. Think well and speak well of all those who owe you. If you talk about them to others avoid calling them names that you would not apply to yourself. Cultivate a genuine feeling of love for them and respect their integrity in spite of all appearances. Declare abundant supply for them and thus help them to prosper. Pray and work for their good as well as for your own, for yours is inseparable from theirs. You owe your debtor quite as much as he owes you and yours is a debt of love. Pay your debt to him and he will pay his to you. This rule of action never fails. Far-seeing Christians look forward to an early resumption of the economic system inaugurated by the early followers of Jesus. They had all things in common, and no man lacked anything. But before we can have a truly Christian community founded on a spiritual basis we must be educated into a right way of thinking about finances. If we should all get together and divide all our possessions, it would be but a short time until those who have the prevailing financial ideas would manipulate our finances, and plethora on one hand and lack on the other would again be established. The world cannot be free from the bondage of debt and interest until men start to work in their minds to erase those things from consciousness. If the United States forgave the nations of Europe all their debts and wiped the slate clean, the law would not necessarily be fulfilled for there would probably remain a thought that they still owed us and that we had made a sacrifice in cancelling the obligations. We should not feel very friendly about it and would not truly forgive them, and in that case the error thought would be carried on. We must first forgive the error thought that they owe us money and that we would be losing money by cancelling the debts. The man who is forced to forgive a debt does not forgive it. Above all we should fill our mind with the consciousness of that divine abundance which is so manifest everywhere in the world today. There is as much substance as there ever was, but its free flow has been interfered with through selfishness. We must rid our mind of the selfish acquisitiveness that is so dominant in the race thought, and in that way do our part in the great work of freeing the world from avarice. It is the duty of every Christian metaphysician to help in the solution of this problem, by affirming that the universal spirit of supply is now becoming manifest as a distributing energy the world over, that all stored up, hoarded, vicious thoughts are being dissolved, that all people have things in common. That no one anywhere lacks anything, and that the divine law of distribution of infinite supply that Jesus demonstrated is now being made manifest throughout the world. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. There is a legitimate commerce that is carried on by means of what is called credit. Credit is a convenience to be used by those who appreciate its value and are careful not to abuse it, for to do so would be to ruin it. 
However, many persons are not equipped to use the credit system to advantage and are likely to abuse it. In the first place, few individuals are familiar with the intricacies of sound credit systems and often assume obligations without being certain of their ability to meet them, especially should some unforeseen complication arise. Frequently an individual loses all that he invests and finds himself involved in a burden of debt in addition. Such things are not in divine order and are largely responsible for retarding prosperity. No one should assume an obligation unless he is prepared to meet it promptly and willingly when it comes due. One who knows God as his unfailing resource can be assured of his supply when it is needed. Then why should he plunge into debt when he is confident of his daily supply without debt? There are no creditors or debtors in God's kingdom. If you are in that kingdom, you need no longer be burdened with the thought of debt either as debtor or creditor. Under divine law there is no reaching out for things that are beyond one's present means. There is an ever-increasing richness of consciousness coming from the certain knowledge that God is infinite and unfailing supply. Outer things conform to the inner pattern, and riches are attracted to the one who lives close to the unselfish heart of God. His environment is made beautiful by the glory of the presence, and there is satisfying and lasting prosperity in his affairs. There is but one way to be free from debt. That is the desire to be free, followed by the realization that debt has no legitimate place in God's kingdom, and that you are determined to erase it entirely from your mind. As you work toward your freedom you will find it helpful to have daily periods for meditation and prayer. Do not concentrate on debts or spoil your prayers by constantly thinking of debts. Think of that which you want to demonstrate, not that from which you seek freedom. When you pray, thank the Father for His care and guidance, for His provision and plenty, for His love and wisdom, for His infinite abundance and your privilege to enjoy it. Here are a few prosperity prayers that may help establish you in the truth of plenty and erase the error thought of debt. They are offered as suggestions for forming your own prayers but may be used as given with excellent results. I am no longer anxious about finances, thou art my all-sufficiency in all things. The spirit of honesty, promptness, efficiency, and order is now expressed in me and in all that I do. I am free from all limitations of mortal thought about quantities and values. The superabundance of riches of the Christ mind are now mine, and I am prospered in all my ways. The 23D Psalm A treatment to free the mind of the dead idea Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want he mocketh me to lie down in green pastures, he letteth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul, he guideth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of Jehovah for Eve. Chapter 3, Tithing, The Road to Prosperity As ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Honor Jehovah with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy vats shall overflow with new wine. Under the Mosaic Law a tithe, or tenth, was required as the Lord's portion. Throughout the Old Testament the tithe or tenth is mentioned as a reasonable and just return to the Lord by way of acknowledging Him as the source of supply. After Jacob had seen the vision of the ladder with angels ascending and descending on it he set up a pillar and made a vow to the Lord, saying, Of all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. 
In the third chapter of Malachi we find God's blessing directly connected with faithfulness in giving to the Lord's treasury, but gifts should be made because it is right and because one loves to give, not from a sense of duty or for the sake of reward. That there will be a reward following the giving we are also assured by Jesus in a direct promise, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall they give unto your bosom. For with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again. Promises of spiritual benefits and increase of God's bounty through the keeping of this divine law of giving and receiving, abound in all the scriptures. There is that scattereth, and increaseth yet more, and there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth only to want. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters. We are living now under larger and fuller blessings from God than man has ever known. It is meet therefore that we give accordingly and remember the law of the tithe, for if a tenth was required under the law in those olden times, it is certainly no less fitting that we should give it cheerfully now. One of the greatest incentives to generous giving is a keen appreciation of the blessing secured to us through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Freely ye received, freely give. True giving is the love and generosity of the Spirit quickened heart responding to the love and generosity of the Father's heart. In his second letter Paul made a stirring appeal to the Corinthians for a generous gift to their poorer brethren in Jerusalem. He suggests some principles of giving that are always applicable, for giving is a grace that adds to the spiritual growth of all men in all times. Without giving the soul shrivels, but when giving is practiced as a part of Christian living, the soul expands and becomes godlike in the grace of liberality and generosity. No restoration to the likeness of God can be complete unless mind, heart, and soul are daily opening out into that large, free, bestowing spirit which so characterizes our God and Father. Therefore it is not surprising that Paul classes the grace of giving with faith, knowledge, and love. A very simple yet practical plan for exercising this grace of giving had been suggested by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian church. Upon the first day of the week, he said, let each one of you lay by him in store, as he may prosper, that is, each member was asked to contribute to the establishing of a treasury. This was to be the Lord's storehouse, into which each one was to put his offerings regularly and in proportion to his means. In adopting this plan the offer became a steward of the Lord's goods and entered upon a course of training and discipline needed to make a good steward, for it takes wisdom to know how rightly to dispense the bounty of God. Perhaps no simpler way to begin one's growth in the grace of giving can be suggested for our own day. Those who have followed this method have usually found that they had more money to give than they had thought possible. In order that the plan of giving may be successful there are several things that must be observed. First there must be a willing mind. If the readiness is there, it is acceptable according as a man hath, not according as he hath not. God loveth a cheerful giver. Secondly, the giving must be done in faith, and there must be no withholding because the offering seems small. Many of the instances of giving that are recorded in the Bible as worthy of special mention, commendation, and blessing are instances where the gift itself was small. The widow who fed Elijah in his time of famine gave him a cake made with her last handful of meal. For her faith and her generous spirit she was rewarded with a plentiful daily supply of food for herself and her sons, as well as for Elijah. The jar of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. This same truth is set forth beautifully in the New Testament, 
where it is clearly shown that not the amount of the offering but the spirit in which it is given determines its value and power. And he, Jesus, sat down over against the treasury, and beheld how the multitude cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a poor widow, and she cast in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, This poor widow cast in more than all they that are casting into the treasury, for they all did cast in of their superfluity, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. This poor widow exemplified what it is to give in faith, and were ever two mites so great a gift as when they brought forth such praise from the Master himself. The results of giving in faith are just as sure in this age as in the time of Jesus, for the law is unfailing in all ages. A third requisite for keeping the law of giving and receiving is that the offering shall be a just and fair proportion of all that one receives. The amount was settled by Paul and the measure he gave was, as he may prosper. There is a certain definiteness about this, and yet it admits of freedom for the giver to exercise his individual faith, judgment, and will. The question of wise distribution is closely related to the matter of filling God's treasury. To whom shall we give and when are questions quite important? There are several truths that may be considered in this connection, but then each individual finds it necessary to trust to the spirit of wisdom manifest in his own heart, since there are no rules or precedents that one can follow in detail. This is as it should be, for it keeps the individual judgment faith, love, sympathy, and will alive and active. Yet a careful study of the underlying laws of spiritual giving will help one to exercise these divine faculties as they should be exercised. If we follow the spirit of wisdom we shall not give to anything that is contrary to the teaching of Jesus, but spend every penny in the furtherance of the good news of life that he proclaims and in the promotion of the brotherhood, of man that it is his mission to establish on earth among all those who become sons through him. True spiritual giving rewards with a double joy, first that which comes with the laying of the gift upon the altar or in the Lord's treasury, then the joy of sharing our part of God's bounty with others. One of the blessings is the satisfying knowledge that we are meeting the law, and paying our debt of love and justice to the Lord. The other is the joy of sharing the Lord's bounty. Justice comes first, then generosity. Even the so-called heathen recognize giving as a part of worship, for we find them coming with offerings when they worship their idols. All ages and all religious dispensations have stressed giving as a vital part of their worship. In this age, when we have so much, more is required of us, even to the giving of ourselves with all that we are and have. This privilege carries immeasurable benefits with it, for it looses us from the personal life, unifies us with the universal, and so opens our inner and outer life to the inflow and the outflow of the life, love, bounty, and grace of God. This is the blessed result of faithful obedience to the law and exercise of the grace of giving. The people were amazed when the prophet Malachi told them that they had been robbing God and desired to know wherein they had failed when they thought they had been serving the Lord so faithfully. People are as much amazed today to learn that they have been untrue to God's law, for the message of Malachi is for us quite as much as for the ancients. The Spirit of God gave this message through the prophet, Bring ye the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast its fruit before the time in the field, saith Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you happy, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith Jehovah of hosts. Study this third chapter of Malachi carefully if you would know the happy solution of the problem of giving and receiving. 
See how practical it is for people in every walk of life and for nations as well. It offers the solution to the problems of the farmer. It sets forth clearly a law of prosperity for all classes of people, for those who need protection for their crops from frosts, droughts, floods, for those who would escape the plagues, pestilences, and manifold things that would destroy their supply and support. It is a simple law but so effective, simply give a tithe or tenth or the first fruits, or their equivalent to the Lord. God should not be expected to meet all man's requirements in the matter of giving this protection and increase unless man fulfills the requirements of God. The act of giving complies with the divine law, because it involves the recognition of God as the giver of all increase, and unless we have a recognition of the source of our supply we have no assurance of continuing in its use. Many people have doubts as to whether it will really do any good to ask the Lord for protection, and for plenty in regard to crops or other supply. Many who are employed in cities or who are in business think it strange that they should believe in omnipresent prosperity. Thus unbelief is present with them at the very time when an unwavering faith is most necessary. There is a psychological reason why people should obey spiritual law. When a person obeys the law of God along any line, his faith immediately becomes strengthened in proportion and his doubts disappear. When anyone puts God first in his finances, not only in thought but in every act, by releasing his first fruits, a tenth part of his increase or income, to the Lord, his faith in omnipresent supply becomes a hundredfold stronger and he prospers accordingly. Obeying this law gives him an inner knowing that he is building his finances on a sure foundation that will not fail him. Everything in the universe belongs to God, and though all things are for the use and enjoyment of man, he can possess nothing selfishly. When man learns that a higher law than human custom and desire is working in the earth to bring about justice, righteousness, and equalization, he will begin to obey that law by tithing, loving his neighbor, and doing unto others as he would have them do unto him. Then man will reach the end of all the troubles brought upon himself by his selfishness and greed, and will become healthy, prosperous, and happy. The pastor of a small church in Georgia suggested to his congregation, composed largely of cotton farmers, that they dedicate a tenth part of their land to the Lord and ask him for protection against the ravages of the boll weevil, which had devastated the crops in that vicinity for several years. Seven farmers in the congregation decided to do this. They took no measures to protect their crop on these dedicated acres, yet the pest did not attack the cotton there. The quality of the fiber was better on those acres than on any that adjoined them. The experiment was so successful in fact that practically all the farmers in that community have decided to follow the plan in the future. Many experiences such as this are awakening men to respect our relation to the infinite principle of life, everywhere present, that we know as God. This divine element of life that manifests itself as growth and substance resides within the factors that combine to produce cotton, wheat, and all other forms of vegetation. Then certainly if the farmer works in acknowledged sympathy with this life principle, it will work in sympathy with him and for his good. Each contributing in love and understanding to the other, a larger crop will be the result, and a larger measure of prosperity for the farmer. Not only the farmer but the banker, the tradesman, the professional man can work in sympathy and harmony with this principle of growth and increase. The infinite life principle is as responsive in one field as another, and it is everywhere present. Even so-called inanimate objects are filled to the full with this infinite life, and even coined gold is tense with the desire to expand and to grow. The materials handled by the tradesmen are made of the same substance that makes the universe and contain within themselves the germ of growth and increase. All men are therefore daily associated with life, and through rendering it the reverent acknowledgement that is its due and through witnessing this acknowledgement by dedicating a part of their increase they are prospered. 
The tithe is the equivalent of the increased fertility of the land. If by acknowledging God as the giver of all life the farmer raises two or six or twenty bushels more on his field, that extra portion, which he would not have had otherwise, is the Lord's portion. In trade the tithe is the equivalent of the increased quality of goods. In professional life the tithe is the increased ability or the increased appreciation. The tithing principle can be applied in all of our industrial and social relationships. In every case where it has been applied and followed for a time, the tither has been remarkably blessed, quite as much so as in the case of the cotton farmers and their tithe acres. There are many people who wish to give but seem at a loss as to how to go about it or where to begin. They do not know how much they should give, or when or how often to offer their gifts, and there are a host of related questions. To answer these questions there must be found a definite basis for their giving, a rule to which they can conform. This is where the law of tithing fits beautifully, for it is a basis and a sound one, tested and proved for thousands of years. The tithe may be a tenth part of one's salary, wage, or allowance, of the net profits of business, or of money received from the sale of goods. It is based on every form of supply, no matter through what channel it may come, for there are many channels through which man is prospered. The tenth should be set apart for the upkeep of some spiritual work or workers. It should be set apart first even before one's personal expenses are taken out, for in the right relation of things God comes first always. Then everything else follows in divine order and falls into its proper place. The great promise of prosperity is that if men seek God and his righteousness first, then all shall be added unto them. One of the most practical and sensible ways of seeking God's kingdom first is to be a tither, to put God first in finances. It is the promise of God, the logical thing to do, and the experience of all who have tried it, that all things necessary to their comfort, welfare, and happiness have been added to them in an overflowing measure. Tithing establishes method in giving and brings into the consciousness a sense of order and fitness that will be manifested in one's outer life and affairs as increased efficiency and greater prosperity. Another blessing that follows the practice of tithing is the continual, letting go, of what one receives, which keeps one's mind open to the good and free from covetousness. Making an occasional large gift and then permitting a lapse of time before another is made will not give this lasting benefit, for one's mind channel may in the meantime become clogged with material thoughts of fear, lack, or selfishness. When a person tithes he is giving continuously, so that no spirit of grasping, no fear, and no thought of limitations gets a hold on him. There is nothing that keeps a person's mind so fearless and so free to receive the good constantly coming to him as the practice of tithing. Each day, week, pay day, whenever it is, the tither gives one-tenth. When an increase of prosperity comes to him, as come it will and does, his first thought is to give God the thanks and the tenth of the new amount. The free, Open mind thus stayed on God is certain to bring forth joy, real satisfaction in living, and true prosperity. Tithing is based on a law that cannot fail, and it is the surest way ever found to demonstrate plenty, for it is God's own law and way of giving. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is Jehovah's, it is holy unto Jehovah. Let us give as God gives, unreservedly, and with no thought of return, making no mental demands for recompense on those who have received from us. A gift with reservations is not a gift, it is a bribe. There is no promise of increase unless we give freely, let go of the gift entirely, and recognize the universal scope of the law. Then the gift has a chance to go out and to come back multiplied. There is no telling how far the blessing may travel before it comes back, but it is a beautiful and encouraging fact that the longer it is in returning, 
the more hands it is passing through and the more hearts it is blessing. All these hands and hearts add something to it in substance, and it is increased all the more when it does return. We must not try to fix the avenues through which our good is to come. There is no reason for thinking that what you give will come back through the one to whom you gave it. All men are one in Christ and form a universal brotherhood. We must put away any personal claim, such as, I gave to you, now you give to me, and supplant it with, inasmuch as ye did it unto one of these my brethren, even these least, ye did it unto me. The law will bring each of us just what is his own, the reaping of the seeds he has sown. The return will come, for it cannot escape the law, though it may quite possibly come through a very different channel from what we expect. Trying to fix the channel through which his good must come to him is one of the ways in which the personal man shuts off his own supply. The spiritual-minded man does not make selfish use of the law but gives because he loves to give. Because he gives with no thought of reward and no other motive than love, he is thrown more completely into the inevitable operation of the law and his return is all the more certain. He is inevitably enriched and cannot escape it. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He was not merely making a promise but stating a law that never fails to function. So inexhaustible is the bounty of the giver of all good that to him who has eyes to see it and faith to receive it God is an unfailing source of supply. The munificent giver withholds nothing from him who comes in the name of a son and heir and lays claim to his portion. It is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, and all that the Father has is ours. But we must have the faith and the courage to claim it. Men who accomplish great things in the industrial world, are the ones who have faith in the money-producing power of their ideas. Those who would accomplish great things in the demonstration, of spiritual resources must have faith to lay hold of the divine ideas and the courage to speak them into expression. The conception must be followed by the affirmation that the law is instantly fulfilled. Then the supply will follow in manifestation. The End You Have Heard Prosperity, Volume 2 by Charles Fillmore, A Creation of Rich and Spiritual.